Hey everyone, this is Loli and Francisco from Nice Game Publishing. Since Heritage is quite an unconventional game with many components and moving parts, we've made a quick start guide. Let's take you through the most important aspects of the game. Here's the game, already set up for the tutorial. Check the guide to see how to do that. This setup is for a custom two-player game. Here we won't use missions since we're focusing on the basics. We'll be using the first three battlegrounds and we've set those up here in the middle. I've decided to play the Bruja and Loli will be playing the Toreador. I'll go first and I start my turn by recruiting a character. I can take any of these, but these two will cost me some power, so I will not do that right now. Now I've taken this character and given them the Vampiric Embrace, so I will add them as a fledgling vampire to my bloodline. I'll place it as a child below my clan leader here who becomes the sire. These roles that vampires have are sometimes referenced on the cards, like all your sires gain one power. So it's good to learn these terms now if you don't have a vampire the masquerade background. Generally, the rule is that each vampire may have three children like this. So as you add characters to your bloodline, you will develop a little bit of a family tree below your leader, with their childer having childer on their own, and so on. Now that I've taken the character and added them, they will do their thing. We call this activating the vampire. It means each of the traits as indicated on the top left of the cards will impact one of the battlegrounds in play. The first one here is the clan's high and low, and it signifies the struggle between higher and lower vampire casts. Since my character is red, they are a noble, so they will support their faction on here by moving one step in that direction. They will earn me one or two victory points at the end of the game if their faction wins. The next battleground is the Beast Within, and it represents your bloodline's struggle against the eternal draw of the internal monster. You will be rewarded for acting consistently here. If your disposition matches that of your clan token, move up a space on the track. But, since I recruited this character here, who doesn't share my previous disposition, as indicated by the token, I will need to flip the token to the new morality and move it down to signify the struggle this causes. But, since struggle leads to new ideas, at least I get to draw a clan scheme, and you always get to do that when you move down on this battleground. In fact, that's one of the few ways to gain new clan schemes in the first place. Finally, we're checking the last attribute here, on the bottom, which represents the geographic origin of my vampire and is linked to the last battleground here, the War of the Princes. In this battleground, the different vampiric courts of Europe are struggling for supremacy by trying to occupy the majority of the regions. And again, since my recruit hails from a certain region, they will lend their power to that faction here on the board. And this time I actually have a choice, I can move any of the envoys to any connected region not already occupied by another faction, but never back to the home region. So I will just move one here. Note that beyond the four main colors, there's also this mixed color, which represents a roaming vampire with no fixed origin. These roaming vampires will not profit from any of the other faction's victory, but they are by themselves worth one victory point, and they are very helpful because when activating them, you will get to choose between the other colors for your activation. So they are very flexible. Now, every turn has two phases. I have to recruit and I can play a scheme, but we'll keep schemes for later, so I will opt not to play one and end my turn. I will recruit the alchemist and activate it. Now that both have played, we need to check who will be the first player for the next round, and we'll see that on the Beast Within. Since I'm alone on the furthest right of the track, I will start the next round. After playing a few rounds, we are clearer on who wants what. So next, we look at how to play schemes. 
Each clan comes with a set of Ds and you will draw three starting schemes as determined by your clan leader. These represent all kinds of special actions that you can send out your vampires to undertake, once per turn. So to do that you will need a team of experts, and the kind of experts you need is determined by these symbols here on the card. These are the archetypes, and each character has one, either warlike, scholarly, clandestine, or wealthy. To play this scheme, I will need to find a coterie that fulfills the scheme's requirements. A warrior and one of any. A coterie always consists of a sire, the coterie leader, and all of their direct childer, as coterie members, like this. Enacting a scheme is pretty simple, I just exhaust the coterie leader and then I enact the effect. Exhausting means that this vampire cannot be the coterie leader again, but they can still be members of another coterie, and if they are unexhausted by another effect, they can even act again. And one more thing, if you are missing a symbol or two for a scheme, you might still be able to play it using your boons. You can award a boon to any vampire in another player's bloodline to use their archetype for a scheme you want to play. The only downside is that your boom is worth one point at the end of the game, so you'll need to make sure that whatever the scheme does, it will be more valuable than the boom you use to play it. After we're done, we place the scheme on our empty scheme discard pile. Note that we will never build a new draw pile, so bearing other effects, this scheme is gone for this game. Instead of playing a clan scheme from our hand, we could also have played one of these public schemes next to the battleground on the table. These battleground schemes help you get ahead on the game board they are associated with. They can be used by anyone repeatedly and are not discarded after use. In a real game we would be playing until we reach the final round indicated by the player count. So now it's time to count the points and I will count mine to show you how to do it. So first we have the scoreboard here and we'll start with the scores for each board. The novel vampires have won giving two points for each red vampire. I have five in my bloodline which are red, that's 10 points for me. And remember, vampires in Torpor are not counted. On the next board, we see that I went really down, meaning minus five points. And in the final field, we see that the Western vampires have won. They have four areas because the center area is worth two. That means that all blue vampires are worth two points. I have four, that means eight points. I also have two roaming or multicolor vampires, which will add two points to my count. Now we will count the power, infamy and boons in my bloodline. Let's start with the power. I have in total seven power among my characters. This one doesn't count because the character is in Torpor. Then the infamy. Each one means minus one point, so that's minus two. These ones uh, don't count because, again, the character is in Torpor. Finally, we have the boons. They are worth one point each. I have here two, and this one doesn't count because the vampire is in Torpor. That's it. Of course, there's much more in the campaign. Upgrading vampires, changing battlegrounds, changing clan schemes, missions to fulfill, and so on. Check out the Chronicle rules in the rulebook. The prologue explains how all of that works. And if you have any questions, be sure to check out the Heritage website where you can find the living rulebook constantly updated with additional content and a lot of other useful stuff. Or hop directly into our Discord to get answers. So that's everything. Yes. Bye Auf bye. Wiedersehen.